CRTV News, nothing but the news. Good day. The curve of uh, the COVID-19 infections has not flattened worldwide. From China, it moved to Europe and then to North America. Now, it is in Brazil. The fear is that it might come to Africa, but God forbid. The global statistics prove, uh, show that 6,875,601 people have been confirmed with COVID-19 worldwide. 399,730 have died thus far, with 3,011,985 people infected. Uh, The USA remains the most infected country with 1,920,061 cases, with uh, 109,802 deaths, with 500 and uh, 84,049 uh, recoveries. I was indicating earlier on that Brazil has moved. The other day, or Friday, was indicated that one person died in Brazil every minute, and the world is, has held its breath that the situation might degenerate and come up to Africa, given that Brazil has almost the same climatic conditions like the African continent. But for now, Africa is still... Um, hasn't yet moved to that stage with we have about just 185,250 people on the African continent with uh, 5,062 dead and 75,622. Egypt remains the hardest hit with 1,198 uh, deaths thus far. Cameroon has recorded 205 deaths, but with 1,996 recoveries. Thus far, 7,392 people have been confirmed with the disease in Cameroon. We'll talk about that and talk about the environment today because uh, those who are taking care or watching over the environment see that it is time for nature and that nature can help us combat COVID-19. How, would, how can nature do that? We have experts here to talk about that with us and we'll have also uh, experts tell us whether they've been able to secure a breakthrough in terms of treatment protocol or in terms of uh, the search for a vaccine and also what is happening with the research concerning uh, the virus. Do they now know everything about the virus or they are still in the process of uh, uncovering everything about the virus. To do that with me on the program this midday, we have from my right to the left, we have uh, Dr. Eric Tandy. He's a public health expert. He's been in Douala for quite, uh, for the past two or three weeks. You're welcome back, doctor. Yeah, thank you. We have uh, Fidelis Pege Manga. He is a communication uh, officer in the uh, WWF Worldwide Fund. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here. We have uh, Dr. Joseph Fokam. He is a virologist. You're welcome. Thank you, Joe. And we have Mr. Augustin Njamshi. He is an environmental justice advocate. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Okay. Let's set the ball rolling with our press review, what the press was feeding on this week. News on the spread of the coronavirus pandemic in Cameroon continue to capture the attention of press men and women in the country. Cameroon Tribune opens the week with school resumption amid COVID-19 scare. To the bilingual daily, classes 6, CM2, Upper Sith and Terminal students effectively resumed school. To the Guardian Post, schools resumed timidly, but the Post writes, schools resumed today despite COVID-19 scare. At the time, the Post says, ghost town paralyzed school resumption across Northwest. The Guardian Post comes back writing school principal commits suicide in Kumba, then goes further to say that government raises over 1.7 billion CFA francs anti-COVID-19 solidarity fund. 
But the post weekender wants to know where the 136 billion CFA francs borrowed to fight COVID-19 is. The Guardian Post writes government in search of 294 billion to mitigate COVID-19 shocks. At the time, government acquires 100,000 rapid test kits on Cameroon Tribune. The paper later takes its readers to COVID-19 centers before telling them of the Ministry of Communications proximity campaign caravan against COVID-19 that tours Yaoundé. The post rather sees looming health catastrophe during COVID-19 in Anglophone hinterlands as hospitals remain closed. The horizon feeds its readers with with the achievements of Minister Kecha Kutes in the fight against COVID-19 pandemic, at a time an overzealous SDO sets Menchum on fire by burning the entry of corpses into the division. This, according to the paper, sparked outrage from the population who think the decision undermines their customs and traditions. But then Senator Busule slams SDO's unfriendly order, advises him to rethink on the post weekend uh, just formal authorization on the Guardian Post, death of detained journalist Samuel Wasizi sparks indignation with colleagues decrying extrajudicial killing and wants perpetrators prosecuted on the post weekend. The Guardian Post headlines when practicing journalism in Cameroon is a crime. The paper further reports that protesting journalists confront Southwest Governor, but Okalia Bilai says Yaoundé better place to respond to their worries. Then Customs seizes 1,256 cartons of contraband canned drinks just when a security guard vamooses with bosses 6 million CFA friends at a time bullets kill church elder as amber fighters clash with military, Mindef says soldiers arrested for theft in Togo will face the law. Sonara in need of 250 billion CFA francs to be rehabilitated also form stories reported by the papers this week. Let's now end our press review with this story on the Post newspaper, which presents hard facts about Boya May 28 massacre. According to Andrew Sosaka of the Post, 11 boys were caught up in the scene of shooting when masked men showed up, had a chat with Black, a supposed drug dealer. Four boys were killed on the scene, and the masked men later identified as gendarmes. Until I come your way again, this is your R with the Press. Thank you, Emanuela. Um, Fidelis, what is peculiar about uh, this year's World Environment Day? The World Environment Day celebration this year comes at a time the, uh, the nature is facing very serious threats. You would understand that in the past uh, 40 years, we've lost about 60% of biodiversity. And there is a risk that in the next 10 years, we might lose about 100 million, uh, a million species if nothing is done. So that is why it is time that you and I, human beings, start thinking of a new way to interact with nature. OK, uh, that sounds quite interesting. Um, uh, and uh, Augustine, many people will say that the world uh, did not make a mistake to tack a day for the environment. And, but the ordinary citizen, uh, ordinary Cameroonian will say, but why a complete day for the environment? Thank you so much. I, I think the, the fact that the world, uh, the United Nations set aside a day for the environment didn't come as a surprise because it was realized since 1972 that the world had to change the way of doing things. You know, talking about the World Environment Day, there is what we call the World Earth Day, which was which is different, which from, is different from the World Environment Day. Mm -hmm. The World Earth Day came as a result of conscientization of Americans when they realized that instead of celebrating pollution as a the smell of the, a, a industrial uh, industrialization, they realized that it was even do, doing uh, great harm to their health. So they said they should set aside a day 
to celebrate and think about how they deal with Mother Earth. Then two years later, the United Nations decided to come across and say every country should celebrate such a day. That is a day of thinking. How we uh, deal with the environment. Using the word celebrate, I would, I would prefer observe. Yeah. Now, um, when you're observing a day de devoted either to Mother Earth or the environment, um, within our own context, what's the degree of awareness that there's something happening to our environment? I mean, within the Cameroonian context or the rural world or the ordinary person on the street? I think um, we celebrate or we observe the World Environment Day every day in our daily lives, especially in the local communities. Because there are people that live on the environment. They take care of that environment. They live on it. They, they get their crops from it, the food, shelter, and even medication. So they celebrate it or they observe it in a very uh, meaningful way and on a daily basis without knowing that they are observing it. You know? But the celebration or the observance at the national level is to call on decision makers to take it seriously. Because it's another one thing, observing a day, and uh, another uh, actually doing activities or having policies that will actually protect and promote sustainable use of, of the environment. So Now, you, you're talking about observing a day uh, that people do what they do as some sort of observance. But they exploit the environment. And it's this exploitation, extra exploitation, which is causing maybe drew the attention of the world that we are not doing it sustainably. Yes, that is actually why we say this is time for nature, because when people are exploiting nature, they don't understand that it is having an impact and that that nature is a, is a life support system for human beings. It provides the food, the water, the air we breathe, and it's a big pharmacy. So what we, we try to do during, during this day is to raise awareness on the need for people to understand that if you exploit nature in an unsustainable manner, chances are we're going to lose a lot of biodiversity and that is going to threaten uh, the, the, our support, life support system on Earth. So we think that it is a time, this is time for the decision makers to, to hack into the call for a new deal for nature and people. Because we think that nature needs to be put at the center of every action that we want to take. Nature is facing a lot of threats. Nature has been, has been unfairly treated by human beings because uh, a recent report that, uh, that was published by WWF in 2018 shows that human beings are the center of biodiversity loss. So it is us, human beings, not, no more natural causes that are, that are behind biodiversity loss because we are the one uh, uh, create, uh, uh, opening uh, plantations, we are the one building industries, we are the one uh, cutting down trees, and we are the one uh, uh, hunting wildlife species and, and the decimating huge population of elephants and so on. So we contribute a lot to the destruction of nature. So we think that if we have to find a solution, human beings must renegotiate their relationship with nature so that we can have we can put nature on the path to recovery by 2030. Now uh, what you say it's extremely interesting how do you strike a balance between development and protection of nature? First and foremost we cannot have development without protecting the environment. Let me tell you if you concentrate on developing without uh, looking at the impact it will have on the environment the cost of it in the, in the coming years will be even more, more higher than what you would have invested. For example, if you want to open up a plantation and you know that this, this, uh, the creation of this plantation is going to result in the cutting down of huge, huge expanse of forest, you must be able to take measures that will attenuate this impact. That's why we are urging the government to ensure that companies that are setting up should come up with environmental, in, they should carry out environmental impact assessment have an environmental management plan that will enable them to define the mitigate, mitigating measures that, we, that, are, that they're going to take to ensure that the environment, the environment, the impact on the environment is reduced. Because people live around the forest. They're, they're about their they hotspot. If you go to areas where you have a huge concentration of elephants, where you have a, a water sources, and you, and you clear the forest around that water source, the, 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 the risk here is that people are going to lack water to drink. We're not going to have access to water, and that is going to have even greater impact on the environment than even the, the proceeds that you are going to make from uh, your, your plantation. So that is what 
why we are saying that it is very necessary for us to put nature at the center of everything. That if we are acting, we should act. In the, we should think about tomorrow. We should not just cut down the forest because we we had 21, uh, 22 uh, uh, million hectares of forest. It's reducing. And it's about 90 million today. So it is, you, you realize that as we go, as okay, we get you're talking along, about the Cameroon, the case in Cameroon. Cameroon, for example, had okay. 22 million hectares of forest. 2006. Today, it's it's, it's, it's less than the, the 20 million. So we are, we we are cutting down forests very rapidly, and this is going to have an impact. We had huge biodiversity potential. This is a country with with the, one of the, the the best biodiversity in Af in in Africa. But if you look at the, the trend in the biodiversity loss, the number of elephants we've lost in the last 10 years, 60% of elephants lost in the last 10 years. The number of uh, other wildlife species that are disappearing in the wilds. The number of forest areas cut down. You understand that we are really facing a serious crisis. And this crisis, we think that it is time leaders of the world come together and say, look, we have understood the critical situation of our planet and we need to take action. And that is why we're saying that at the level of the UN, we should be able to have a, a commitment, an ambitious emergency declaration for the New Deal for nature and people. Once you have that New Deal and you have very, you, you, you have very, very ambitious plans, then we can then move into implementing them. Why are we talking about climate change? Whereas biodiversity is very, very important. Climate change is a consequence of uh, uh, the irresponsible exploitation of our biodiversity. But if you look at the discussion okay. of climate change, head of state are talking <laughs> about it. When it comes to biodiversity, it is not given that particular privilege that it should be given. And that is where we have uh, uh, d difficulties in, in starting to solve this problem. That, that sounds interesting, what he just said. And I, and I saw you quip. <laughs> but uh, uh, man is exploiting the environment as if it's unlimited that it, it, it has provided unlimited resources. Yeah, I, I think that is a mistake man has made and it has not just been realized today. It was realized since 1972, as I said, in Stockholm when the governments of the world came together and said that we cannot continue developing the way we've been developing because we're impacting on the environment and the future generations will lack where to stay. And uh, talking about that, uh, it is was also declared in Rio in 1992. They, we had what they was called the Rio Declaration. Principle 10 of Rio Declaration is very clear. It says that sustainable development can only be attained if citizens, that is you and I, and the common man, have access to information about the environment, participate in decision making about this environment, and even have access to justice on the environmental decision making. He just but made what do we of, see? Yes. What do we see? We see a colonial mentality of environmental protection that is secluding the people from their environment and criminalize them in such a way that they don't participate actively in decision making. And so policies are up there and the people on the ground who are at the forefront of this environmental protection are never having a seat on the decision-making table. This is where it's wrong. Is, is it possible that uh, the common man uh, should get access to the decision-making table? Of course, if decisions that are taken are not based on what comes from the ground, they will remain in conference rooms and offices in the ministries and will never work on the ground. Why are we having the loss of biodiversity? It's because, part, partly because the common person doesn't see themselves as part of the solution. And they have not been made to see that. Don't you that see way. it as um, a struggle for survival on the part of the common man? It is very, very possible to live in an environment and develop well, while still taking into consideration the, 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 the environmental part of it. That's why we say think nature. Let me give you an example. When you go to the village, we have laws and taboos and myths that have been protecting our environment before the coming of the white man. Okay? There are, gro there, there are places, sacred forests that we have in our lands. There are laws that you don't have to go into a forest on a particular day. They leave the forest to have a break. To regenerate. There are certain animals that should not be killed and things like that. Even hunting regulations, traditional hunting regulations, protect the environment. But these have not been taken into consideration generally in our environmental policies. 
That is why we call on the powers that be to integrate, to make people be participants, to see their interest in it. Okay. Now, uh, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the theme this year is time for nature, right? How do you relate that with the ongoing pandemic? I'll begin with you, uh, Fidelis, uh, then we'll end up with... I think uh, the, the, the pandemic has shown us that we need to re rethink how we, we, we interact with nature. Uh, and it, it, is, it is often said that, okay, if, if you look at uh, the, 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 the appearance of zoonosis, sometimes it is because of the, the way we interact with nature. We've destroyed a lot of forests, and we've p p because of a food for what we need to feed uh, the world population, we are creating more plantation, and we're coming into contact with species. We've moved and pushed some species out of their habitats, and the interaction has been so huge that it is having an impact on the on on human beings and on our health. The nature is very very important because it's our source of health. All everything we are doing, all the vaccines, all the the the, the, the attempts to, to 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 find a vaccine for COVID. It's in nature. We've had cases where people are saying that they are using medicinal plants to treat COVID. How, how true that, it, that is, I don't know, but I think that they are relying on nature for this medicinal plant. If, this, if the forest wasn't there, you would not have these plants. If the forest wasn't there, you would not have uh, the, the Prunus African. This, these, are, these are medicinal plants that are found in nature. So this is time for nature because we, we have to rely on nature to solve this problem of, of, of zoonosis, okay. of viruses. Okay. Uh, maybe you have one word to chip in in that light. I, I time think for nature. Time for nature. We have, to think, we have to think nature because it has been proven that most of the time we have problems because we are treating nature as if it's something that is, can be just be treated anyhow. So we have to think always that nature is there. Mother Earth is a, is, is a living being. You know, you don't have to treat it as if it's something that you just have to exploit as if there's no tomorrow. It reacts. Maybe it's just a way of reacting from Mother Earth that we're having some of these crises, climate change, tsunamis, and then these diseases. So we should think nature, act nature, and live in harmony with nature. And I can guarantee you that those who think and act nature and the rural communities, because they know without the nature, they cannot survive. Okay, thank you so much. I'll, I'll be coming to uh, scientists shortly, but let's trans uh, transit with what uh, Fidelis just said, what Monseigneur, uh, His Grace uh, Samuel Cleda did propose. Thus he had a press conference to, to come up with the name of what he has proposed to the Cameroon community uh, to be able to help cure uh, COVID-19. Already 3,000 patients treated of COVID-19 and no deaths recorded since the Archbishop of Douala, Samuel Cleda's herbal remedy combination by name Elexi COVID and Asda COVID went public and administered across health structures in Cameroon. Officially presenting the product during a press conference in Douala, Archbishop Samuel Cleda disclosed that the treatment is protected by the Organization for Intellectual Property and can be found at St. Paul de Nilong, L'Hôpital de Serre de Lokpom, L'Hôpital Saint Albert de Bonaberry, and L'Hôpital Saint Padre Pew to derail hundreds of Cameroonians from flooding the Roman Catholic Archdiocese of Douala. The clergyman added that the Diocese of Betwa, Bafusam, Bamenda, Boya, and Bafang also have the remedy in stock for persons who have tested positive while he works with the funds provided by goodwill persons to get the product on the international level. The Archbishop noted he had signed contracts with some enterprises to make the product available, which for now is still not administered in many public hospitals. Okay, so the name is Alexis COVID. That's what uh, the should I call it the inventor of that uh, drug has named it, but uh, Dr. Uh, Fokam, um, we are glad. I'm sure you were in the coup.
talking about the environment. I did that deliberately so that when you when you are talking, uh, that you shouldn't uh, think that you talk so much because this is your own time. But let me begin with you, Dr. Fokam. Uh, what's the latest update from the world of science concerning COVID that we should know? Uh, thank you, Joe. I think the latest update we have first of all is in Cameroon. We are happy with uh, Archbishop Leda. He's coming forward with his, with his put up. Now we need to go through assessment. And I, I think uh, Dr. Tandy will better uh, talk on that, doing clinical trials. And why? Because after the recent study published on in, in, in the Lancet Journal, which is a scientific journal uh, by Merad and collaborator, uh, that article has been ret retracted from uh, the public. Why? Because uh, the data integrity has not been been ensured. Okay. And this article also was reporting like poor outcome for those who were exposed to hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine with or without a macrolide. And we did mention that yes, topic uh, yeah, two weeks yes. ago. Yes, so mm -hmm. exactly this article has been retracted and they recommended to conduct clinical trials. And amazingly now we have two clinical trials that have been conducted. The first one was conducted by uh, a group in the UK. Uh, they did a study to evaluate if uh, hydroxychloroquine could have some some kind of clinical benefit in terms of uh, preventing or treating uh, COVID-19. But amazingly, what they realized in this study, they had so many uh, so many armed of participants in this study. One mm -hmm. group was uh, those who were exposed to hydroxychloroquine. The other group was taking uh, lupinavir, which is an antiretroviral uh, drug against HIV. Then there, was, there, were, there were also those who were receiving uh, what we call uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, either uh, dexamethasone, that which is common also in our context in here, in yeah. here, here in Cameroon. Mm -hmm. And also some of them were taking these new uh, drugs that, that, that are available in Western countries that we don't have here in our context. So but what we realized is uh, chloroquine didn't show any clinical benefit in terms of preventing COVID-19 or in terms of preventing a positive result. You know, COVID-19 is a disease. Then having a positive result is the infection. So there was no clinical benefit with uh, chloroquine on these two outcomes. And the outcome was done within uh, 24, 24, within, no, yes, within two weeks. Yes, for instance. Then the other study also that was conducted in in in, in America and, and in part of in part of Canada also uh, showed that uh, it it wasn't possible to find also a benefit when using a uh, hydroxychloroquine compared to a usual care that we have for those who have COVID nineteen. So those who who are positive for, for those who are positive for COVID nineteen. They are hospitalized, then they receive maybe a uh, respiratory assistance and all what we do to improve uh, 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 respiration. So there was no significant difference be with, be between this group and those who receive intervention with uh, chloroquine. So the world of science is still on a standby and we strongly believe that Africa also needs to come in. If the Western world is unable to come up with a definite solution, it is high time for us to promote also our own product. Now, have you been making the publications which you have been uh, finding out here in Cameroon and from the African continent as well? I think that's really our next uh, debate on this forum. And I also want to praise your panelists because uh, in this same forum, we did raise the importance to promote uh, Archbishop Klager's product. And amazingly, some few days after he was received by the Prime Minister, so maybe you had some impact on this also. At the same time, also, we believe it is time that you should also promote the possibility to conduct standard assessment of product. This uh, product from Cameroon needs to undergo what we call a randomized clinical trials for us to really have a clear cutoff if the effect being, uh, if the effect of the product is really true or if maybe it's just a placebo effect. Since we know 80% of those who have COVID-19 are asymptomatic. So they get cured without even knowing they were positive. And among the 20% who have some clinical symptoms, 15% mm. have just moderate symptoms. They are not really critical. So we have just 5% who are critical in the 100% who are infected. So how do we know it's a product? 
without doing a clinical trial is very difficult. Okay. Uh, what you say is extremely interesting, and that's where my next question comes up. And the question has to do with um, what you scientists are doing in Cameroon, what your, the, your colleagues are doing on the African continent, and maybe striking a balance with what you get from outside. Do you feed them with what you are doing here? If not, what are you treating and what do you tell your, your colleague scientists about the recoveries that you've had? What do you tell them that this is what we have used, this is what we've used, and we've had this number of recoveries? What do you tell them? What do you share? Yes, effectively in our context, actually, we, we have 60% of recovery rate, which is a good result for us because it means that, uh, as we expected, a good number of those who were infected, they are gradually getting cured. They are recovering. That's, gradually. that's what you call the critical cases. No, not the critical cases, overall. Okay, overall. So in this, in this whole 60%, uh, we have those who are critical. They are the minority. And those who are asymptomatic or those who have just, uh, just mere symptoms. Now, what you ask is really is quite tricky because now we need to know what's happening with those that really have this critical uh, disease in our context. And I believe the scientific commission headed by uh, Professor Sogri, they are really working hard on that. We know how Professor Sogri is good, how, 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 how skillful he is, and how serious he is also. Uh, so we believe uh, in a, probably in a short while, we may also share the Cameroonian experience in terms of COVID-19 management. Even if it will just be an observational assessment, but still it will give us at least a snapshot of what is happening also in our context. And maybe other African countries may, might also benefit. And maybe we can even just compare what we are doing routinely even with a clinical product, who knows? Exactly. Now, um, when you listen to what he's saying, and you've been on the beat, that I mean the COVID-19 beat since uh, the first cases were detected here in the country on the 5th of, uh, of, of March or so. What has been the trend thus far in terms of your observations, in terms of what you're doing in the medical world? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Joe. Uh, I should first of all appreciate uh, the panelists who spoke on environmental issues, which are uh, very, very sensitive and important to our environment or to our living together, like I can say. Uh, but uh, living also. Together with the environment? Yes. <laughs> not the political slogan. <laughs> not, not the political slogan. Okay. And then here I should say, as the population keeps propagating, we are bound to keep pushing the environment so that we can have adaptation of cohabiting with the environment because we cannot live in an environment that was 100 years behind because the population during that time doesn't have the same composition like now. That is why we are experiencing some of these issues. We cannot also stay without exploiting some of these forests because without explo exploiting these forests, we cannot have some of these facts. We cannot have some of the vaccines you people just mentioned. So it is a kind of living together. We can't, we, the forest cannot be there and the population is not there and the population cannot be there without the forest. So we have to cohabit. Coming back to your question, Joe, I think uh, the hitting 90 days uh, in the pandemic already uh, is, is a concern that is very challenging, not only to governments uh, around the world, but also to the, the Cameroonian government as well. As well. Uh, if you notice, there have been each level, there have been modification in policies and with uh, preventive measures and other measures put in place due to changing in situation. From the beginning on this panel, uh, we were not talking of face masks. And then shortly we get into everybody getting behind face masks. And then again, getting to a situation where we have to observe strict physical distancing. Being in the field for the past three weeks, uh, especially in the littoral region, was not only for COVID alone, but remember other health issues as far as public health is concerned were of let's, let's onwards important as yes, well. <laughs> yes, let's dwell on your experience there as regards COVID-19. Okay, um, focusing more on COVID-19 was uh, since uh, the uh, 
uh, emergency incident management system was put in place at the central level, it was equally important that this should be replicated at the regional level and the district level. And again, with the decentralization process, it makes it everybody receive it, but they didn't know the content. How to go about this? Who has to do what? So that is one of the things that I ensured that it should be put in place at the level of uh, the regions. So now right at the district levels, uh, individuals know what they have to do. What who has to do surveillance? Okay. Who has to do communication? All right. And then together with the mayors taking charge, especially if uh, we have challenging situation where a case is lost. Okay. Who has to take responsibility? In, in the barrier. Yes, in okay. the barrier. Uh, there are so many complaints uh, coming up that people, uh, those who want to be tested, cannot be tested when they want to be tested. And also that even when they are tested, it takes some time for the results to, to be made public. Did you have that in Douala as well? Yeah, actually uh, in Douala it was the case, but that was from the onset, but now things have changed. Uh, we have more than three centers that are doing this analysis already in, in, in Douala. And again, uh, with the rapid tests that have come up, this has come to solve the problem. Because before, there was really that difficulties because you collect more than 1,000 uh, samples and then you have to analyze maybe maximum uh, 100 a day. So it keeps people waiting. But as of now, the government has provided uh, rapid tests uh, that will help to solve this problem. And that is why in the days ahead, we might be expecting to see more persons having uh, their, their results uh, issued as fast as possible, as well as being screened. Okay. Uh, 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 Dr. Fokam, uh, you just made mention of uh, asymptomatic cases and that those who are critical are those that are taken care of. How do you, be, people say that those who are asymptomatic are more dangerous than even those who have been declared uh, who are sick? Mm -hmm. Am yes, I right? Uh, that's, that's partially true, but, 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 but maybe before going on that, I just want to give one word on, on what uh, uh, Dr. Tandy just put in also from the Little region. Mm -hmm. Effectively, you are right, uh, some people do complain that they want to be tested, but they cannot get access to the test. One, because uh, the test was initially intended for those who were sus suspected cases. Sim okay. So you have some symptoms, dry cough, fever, uh, 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 tiredness, and so on. So those were the most prioritized population for the testing. Then secondly also, the test was also targeting those contact person. Contact person is someone who is exposed to a person who has a positive result. So we presume that you might have also acquired the infection. Mm -hmm. So it was targeting those two key populations. Okay. So we have a risk assessment score. If you are below that risk assessment score, it means you have a minimum risk. So you are likely not positive. Then secondly also, uh, what we are doing now, because uh, with WHO, the minister has recommended that we should be, we should be doing 50,000 tests at least by the end of June. So now we are going out for massive testing. Mm -hmm. And as Dr. Tandy highly mentioned, because of that, we have a bunch of patients or people coming for the testing. So our capacity is almost challenged. Uh, like actually we have been working throughout this weekend 24 hours and we have been asked to test at least 4,000 samples in Yaoundé for two days so we are trying to meet that target and now for result uh, delivery also what's happening with result delivery is since we were initially uh, uh, issuing out paper result and the, 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 the pipeline might, might not be as fast as possible so what we have Electronic. actually revi revised in terms of result delivery is SMS. Okay. So what we are doing now, you may be negative, you may be positive, we issue out result by SMS in your phone. Okay. So you easily know what, what you have, either you are positive or negative. So now it's quite easy. And that also helps to reduce stigma. Because okay. you know, uh, some people living in an environment where we have positive COVID-19 uh, uh, patients, mm -hmm. they seem to run away from them. So these people have like, they are worthy of disgrace because of COVID, mm -hmm. which shouldn't be the case. Because with COVID, what we know now is, if you are positive with COVID today, you have more or less like six days to start developing the symptom. Maximum 14 days, you already have the symptoms. And then 14 days thereafter, after the onset of symptoms, you are likely to be cured, cured completely, with or without any medical intervention. So a COVID case would difficultly go beyond a month. 
So definitely we want people to understand if you have some clinical signs of COVID, yes, go quickly for testing. Your result will surely come out very fast by SMS. Now we also have rapid testing. Permit me to come back to what uh, uh, Dr. Andy Riley mentioned. Mm -hmm. Rapid testing means uh, your sample is collected within 15 minutes. The result uh, can be issued also. Okay. Okay. And if you are positive, we have now what we call a kit. This kit is made up of uh, vitamin C, zinc, and also an antibiotics. That might help also to minimize the risk of Developing disease severity the disease. in case you are really uh, critical. Okay. Let's talk about uh, stigmatization. Then we'll come back to the technicalities of the disease uh, shortly. And thus, let me move to those who, uh, who were talking about uh, the environment. Um, that's this problem of stigmatization, which is uh, like uh, making people not to feel uh, at ease to go to test themselves or even to say we've had this disease, but we've had public authorities come out and say, uh, thank God I've been cured. I was uh, COVID-19 positive. Don't, isn't that uh, like some sort of a booster? I think the action of the leaders or the political leaders that have come out to say, I had COVID and I'm killed is a very positive step. You know, lack of knowledge about an ailment or a diseases brings a lot of misinformation and misconstruction in how people address it. Stigmatization kills even faster than, than uh, the disease the itself. itself. Mm -hmm. Let me just give you one example. Some time ago, I was in Germany, I had malaria, I could not have medication for malaria in Germany. So I moved to Paris thinking that when I get there, I will have ready medication because there are a lot of Africans in Paris. Immediately I stepped into the pharmacy and I said, I had malaria. Can you have some medication? The pharmacist ran away, literally ran away from me. And I, I looked behind me, I thought there was some other person behind me, but he was running away from me. He went and called his supervisor, who came and stood metres away from me and told me to go and get treatment. Then the situation about COVID and then, was worse. Then, believe me, Joe, that evening in my hotel room, I almost died. It was because of the shock that I received from the pharmacy, okay? So if somebody has COVID and you start running away from the person, you make as if he's a, an outcast that will aggravate the situation. Even if the person was going to be healed naturally, as doctor has said, even without it medication, will play on the it will play on the patient, mm -hmm. the person until probably he will get worse. Mm -hmm. So stigmatization is something that we should really work on. Yes, and I like I, the, the facts and the figures that the specialists are giving us to assure us that it is not as bad as we think. I think COVID has come to stay. Just like COVID AIDS. has come to stay like HIV, AIDS and stuff like that, like malaria. So let's be dealing with it in a very The president of the way. Republic said, don't panic, yeah. even if you have it. Yes, because initially the perception that the public had was that once you have COVID, you are... You, you it's, are a, it's a death sentence. It's a death mm -hmm. sentence, you know. And we saw the figures coming from China, the U.S., with a number of deaths and so on, and the minister... Uh, kept sending those figures out there and so people had that perception that once you are COVID positive it means that you are condemned to death and that is why everybody was afraid. I was in uh, I, was, I was driving through um, how do you call it, um, um, Vongbi and there was a bus transporting uh, those uh, suspected COVID cases that have just arrived on the airport and it was passing through the market there and people were shouting Go away with that, your coronavirus. Go away with that, your coronavirus. <laughs> you know, that perception is there. And uh, people believe that, okay, if you are COVID positive, you are synonymous to a dead person. So that is, that is why we, we have this stigmatization taking place. Okay. Uh, 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 doctor, did you visit any of the Catholic hospitals in Douala to see for yourself how uh, those who were coming with COVID or how they were receiving the treatment from His Grace Cleda? Uh, not really, but uh, we had, uh, during our daily briefing, we had uh, representations from uh, the Catholic uh, system participating in the meetings. So they were actually giving their facts and evidence, uh, but that notwithstanding. Now, what did you come away with from 
your only your, from your ears and your understanding as a medical doctor yeah actually the, the 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 data that was being presented because remember every day we have briefings there's what we call briefing on daily basis as far as each institution is concerned so the ones we're having from the catholic was that uh, the cases we've received that have been confirmed positive are recovering from uh, from the disease so we're appreciating because just like uh, uh, my colleague has rightly said there are clinical things, there are th procedures to observe as far as uh, any treatment. How long will it take for us to get through those uh, procedures, uh, given that uh, uh, our researchers and uh, people who are concerned have gone down to Douala to see Monsignor Cleda? Following international standard and WHO, we have a minimum of 24 months uh, and counting to have uh, conclusions because- Even in emergency situations like what we have now? Yeah, in emergency situation, that is what has been issued now that uh, tentatively, uh, nationally, this, can, this product can be used. That is why we have uh, Cleda's products being presented. Okay. So, but to go and have a stamp on it, it has to take some time in order to actually do a, a complete follow-up. Okay. Uh, from the report we got there about uh, the press conference which the Archbishop granted, he said other countries are asking for it. Should Cameroon give it to other countries like Madagascar has been doing, Doctor? Yes, we believe uh, same as Madagascar is also a great opportunity for us to really sell what we have like know-how mm -hmm. in Cameroon and help other countries. But also, as we are saying, we need to be a bit careful. Uh, mm -hmm. You remember Professor Raoul had a big uh, promotion on chloroquine, youth hydroxychloroquine, and we were already producing chloroquine <laughs> in Cameroon. We are not saying chloroquine is not effective but mm -hmm. we see for now there is no proven mm -hmm. benefit mm -hmm. of using chloroquine same as for now be it the madagascar product be oh, it the one in cameroon enough. we don't yet have any clear evidence and we really want our own leaders to take this as a challenge make sure it should go through a normal assessment so that at the end of it we should be able to say cameroon has a product yes following evidence-based uh, medicine. Okay. And also because the very last point also, because as mm -hmm. you already mentioned here, there are so many asymptomatic cases. Mm -hmm. And we just discussed this issue of, of asymptomatic. Being asymptomatic doesn't mean uh, you cannot transmit. They are potential transmitters. And more dangerous. So, yeah, they are more dangerous in transmitting. So we need to be careful. We need to be careful within our community uh, because there is a big risk that saying we have so many asymptomatic cases. People might understand that there is no major risk in getting COVID. And no. You should take precaution. COVID, COVID transmission is very high. The R0 is three at least. So mm -hmm. one infectious person can infect at least three, 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 three other people during his infectious period, be it symptomatic or, as, or asymptomatic. Okay. Now, uh, what about... Um Breakthroughs. Have you had, uh, since you are in regular touch with the scientific world, have you had any breakthroughs in terms of uh, getting the root causes of the, of, the, of the virus or in terms of uh, uh, something which the scientific world has been able to get through or put through in relation to uh, this COVID-19? Yes, so far what we know to the best of our knowledge is that uh, the virus from China, as we also mentioned last time, is changing, moving from, from China to Europe to America. And <coughs> there, there might be one potential implication for this is that a vaccine might not be universally effective if mm -hmm. the virus is That's changing right. from one context to, to the, the other. other. And strain. also the transmission rate might also vary from one strain to the other as well. And we actually have some preliminary results from uh, Europe at the Institute Pasteur precisely on a uh, vaccine against COVID-19. Uh, they have a candidate vaccine which is like 98% at least effective on uh, COVID uh, virus. The but strand of the disease which is in, which is in France exactly. or which is the in Europe. Which, which is which it is the same Europe. one in all of Europe? Or? Yes, what, what, do, what, what they have realized is that this particular vaccine is a monoclonal antibody. So it's an antibody that can detect several different strains. Mm -hmm. okay. So it can also detect uh, SARS-CoV-1, the first one, and also <laughs> the Middle East uh, uh, severe acute syndrome virus as well. Okay. So it covers all those major human coronaviruses, but now there's one major unknown is that 
we don't know up to when this vaccine can be protective. Is it three months? Is it six months? Is it 12 months? And it's as Tandy uh, highly mentioned, we need time to evaluate the effectiveness of a vaccine, at least 12 months. Okay. Now, maybe for clinical trials, we could mitigate uh, going it a bit on emergency cases, but for vaccine trial, we, st we are still ongoing with those observations. Okay. Uh, uh, Elvis has just come in with the online reactions uh, to the various uh, speakers here or the issues which we've been handling. Yes, quite a good number of reactions. We may not be able to take all. Just a few uh, would do, yeah, as uh, usual. Joe Waters, I hear the scientific world is unable to know everything about the pandemic because it's of inadequate technology, insufficient trust on local medicine, and too much political influence. Paco Paxson says the scientific world seems to have been given too much Western connotation to the virus, whereas Africans can best do the trick, giving the necessary support to our traditional practitioners. And Molunaj Bob says if HIV patients can live without much stigma, what about those carrying HIV, uh, the coronavirus pandemic? Mary Kilachin says the scientific world is unable to know everything about the disease because the disease is a sort of a political disease. And uh, Joachim Augustine says it is bad to make mockery of someone sick of the COVID-19. While COVID, uh, Elvis, American, says COVID-19 pandemic is a war fought without weapons. Hmm. And we conclude with Chia Kwanga, who says, why leave burning uh, 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 issues to be concentrating on uh, let me take it over again. While leave burning issues to look at uh, COVID-19, he was referring to other issues that we also include in the program because there's a lot of talk on our platform on the death of the journalist uh, Samuel Wazizi. Okay. We'll have time to talk about Samuel Wazizi, but I think that uh, COVID-19 is a global, uh, global war that we're fighting. And so uh, we need to inform and educate the public as much as possible because it's, it will affect everybody. It's affecting everybody, including the entire world. Thank you so much, Elvis. We'll take the rendezvous for the same time next week. Um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tandy, uh, let me begin with you, uh, Njamshi, uh, Augustine. Um, what have you noticed about the attitude of people in the neighborhoods and what would you advise them to do? I, I think that um, the more we have information about COVID-19, the better it gets. I remember the first few weeks uh, when you saw an ambulance in your neighborhood, everybody would think that there's death uh, in the neighborhood because of COVID-19 or somebody has been taken away because of COVID-19 and it's like a, a crime. But now regularly people are improving their knowledge on it and think the acceptance is there. And uh, as doctor said, when they are there's an availability of testing uh, kits that will make people know that it is easy to get their results faster. They will not be bold enough to go and get themselves tested. So eventually we'll be seeing uh, an acceptance of the disease and then people will be observing the regulations that have been put in place or the measures that have been put in place by the government to, to stop the spread of the, uh, the COVID-19. Again, let me just chip in one thing. It is predicted that by 2030, 50% of the world's population will be living in urban areas. Now imagine what will happen in the slums, the urban slums, if we don't take action and educate people in a way that they will know how to live among themselves to avoid the spread of this disease. So we should take care of that. I see the environmental advocate in what you're saying. Thanks. Yes. Now, um, w w it, I, there are some people who uh, are not yet so used to the wearing of their face mask. And not only that, but uh, they th some of them threw away their face mask. And uh, the, 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 the University of Hamilton, I said it earlier on, the University of Hamilton in Canada said that uh, in a recent publication, uh, said that um, if you maintain uh, a two meter physical distance, you are about 80% protected from COVID-19. If you add your face mask, you add 15% on that protection. And if you do add your uh, hygiene uh, uh, 
uh, hygiene conditions by washing your hands or sanitizing your hands, you add the 5%, you are about 100% protected. Now, Cameroonians, many of them, are yet not embracing these preventive measures. What else should be done to be able to help Cameroonians understand that preventive measures are the most appropriate? Yeah, Joe, I think uh, the only thing we need to do is to bring the population to understand the need and the importance of this. And this is only through sensitization. We can't move behind them with guns. We can't move behind them policing them. It is a collective effort and each and every one of us must be disciplined, must have this information. I want to appreciate, I would like to get to the point of sensitization again. Community actors have taken the challenge now. I mean, like even traditional leaders mm -hmm. have come to a situation where they're imposing now in their communities certain conditions that in each home or household, there should be a hand washing kit. Mm. And they have gone as far as even putting some vigilant uh, persons in their various communities to see if people do talk together without respecting physical distancing. I think uh, sensitization and communication, just like uh, uh, what we are doing here, is very important. And okay. that is what the government has encouraged okay. and has decentralized all everything so that you in your various communities take the action in your hands. If you had something to, to say to the public in relation to COVID-19, what would you say? Well, I would urge the public to try as much as possible to respect the uh, social distancing. Barrier measures. Yes, I think it is, it is I, I, I realize that people don't seem to take it seriously. As I was coming here, I looked at the number of people wearing masks in the street, with less than 20%. So I begin to understand that maybe they need something that can shock them, for them to be able to, to, to act. Initially, when it started, people were like taking it seriously. This is a serious disease. They were afraid. But as it time, time went on, as the, the measures were they, they were, 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 were yes, government brought were, in the relief relaxed measures. the measures a bit. People went back to their normal habits. So maybe we need we need to be a bit alarmist here to, in order to save life. If we don't do it that way, a lot of people become indifferent and they don't take action. Okay, communication strategies. Government will have to devise another way of making mm -hmm. the people understand the seriousness of uh, the disease. Now, uh, to you, Dr. Fokam. Um, you people know the A to Z of the other coronaviruses. Mm -hmm. Why has it not been easier to just get through? Because this is a third strand okay, of the thank disease. You, uh, thank you so much, Joe. Uh, I mean, I really want to mention that in Cameroon, for instance, at the Chantal Bia International Reference Center, as in so many, so many other research organizations in Cameroon, we are really at the front line against COVID-19 doing the testing. So what we have understood for now is that the virus keeps changing and once okay. the virus keeps changing it means we need to develop different strategies to be able to overcome the virus uh, replication uh, mechanism that's one and then for two experimental yes. and within Cameroon what we have which is confirmed is we have medical intervention that will help you to relief going throughout through that symptom that symptomatic period and that's what we in Cameroon we are strongly encouraging to make sure we limit the risks of mortality within our within our context and that has been highly effective mm -hmm. so if you have any symptom of COVID-19 do not delay too much in the community trying any local product go directly at the health facility get tested there's rapid testing if you are at risk then you are going to receive our kit and this kit is provided for free mm -hmm. and is now available in Cameroon Thank you very much, Doctor, for concluding on that positive note. And mm -hmm. thank you all, gentlemen, for coming. Uh, the disease is real. The infection in the country is real. And so, uh, like we did make mention earlier on, there are so many uh, things which we have to do, but the greater part is what you have to do to protect, protect not only yourself, but protect your neighbor as well. And know that as of today, the world is counting about 6.1 million cases of COVID-19 with 399 deaths already with 
3 million, uh, 3.1 million recoveries. On that positive note from Dr. Fokam, we conclude this edition of the uh, Sunday Afternoon Magazine Program Press. I will invite you to uh, stay tuned to the broadcast tomorrow afternoon on CRTV if you didn't watch uh, the program from the beginning or you would want to get other facts which were said and didn't hear well. Stay with CRTV if you can. On CRTV, Tam Tam will be following, Tam Tam Weekend rather, will be following shortly immediately after this program. And on CRTV News, the news continues. Good day.